the Hadzabi hunter-gatherers of East Africa epitomize the lifestyle and culture that I imagine our ancient ancestors used to live. I've been visiting the Hadza yearly to learn all of their skills that they can teach. These skills are numerous and make them a very self-sufficient culture. Recently, I discovered one of the skills, which of course is so important to human beings, art. In this video, we investigate some ancient Hadza rock paintings and we try to figure out what they might mean and what the history is. And you can see there's some paintings up on the rocks here, but a lot of it is washed away. Temple. Oh, yeah. There's the trunk, ears, legs. This reminds me of the Hadza once telling me that the elephant is the one animal that they fear most out of any of the others. Although quite washed out, there are numerous types of paintings, mostly done in red and white. Unfortunately, I can't seem to get any good answers out of the Hadza as to what they would have used to paint this with or who would have painted them. There seems to be almost no recollection of the history of these paintings. It is quite obvious that the elders Tonka and Situ are deep in discussion trying to decipher some of these paintings and their meanings. Msinto seems to have a pretty good idea of what these certain paintings mean. Some paintings are certainly easier to identify, such as people, bows and arrows, there's even a giraffe, an elephant, and even what looks to be like an owl. One painting in particular revealed an absolutely mind-blowing story. And this painting is more like a map. It looks like a stick figure, but as Msinto describes, it points the directions of safety to the Hadza. This was drawn a long, long time ago, when there was big conflict in the area between the Iraqi tribe that are pastoralists and the Hadza. This map points that there's danger in the direction of north, and in that direction there was a giant rock of which there was a terrible massacre of Hadza people. The story tells of only two Hadza surviving the massacre on top of this rock where they were bedding down for safety from the Iraqi tribe. The survivors were a boy and a girl. They ran off into the wilderness. From what I can interpret through this understanding, and there's definitely going to be something lost in translation, I'm certain of that. It seems like these were the last two of the Hadza at the time. They procreated, which regenerated the Hadza population to what we understand it to be today. I can't speak to the authenticity of this story as I've tried to research and cannot find any information to corroborate that story, but it's still fascinating. If the story is true, it would make more sense to me as to why so much history has been lost in translation through these paintings. If there was a giant massacre, that history would have been snuffed out, which was usually passed down by storytelling. <laughs> Sindhu explains that once upon a time, the heaven and the earth were upside down. The Hadza would make their fires on the heaven, which ended up hurting the heaven, and it would complain and cry. So God turned them upside down and gave earth for the Hadza to live on and make fire and use all of its natural materials. It also gave the Hadza the gift of painting. And this was a gift from God. They believe that it was spiritually enlightened people that did these paintings back in the day. I am not confident in the accuracy of this translation. Um, it seems to be a little confusing to me, but this is what I've understood from their explanations. <laughs> We're the first. Unbelievable to think that might be true. I feel very honored. With all that we had learned, I felt it absolutely mandatory to go and find this rock that the Hadza talk about. They explained that the direction that it was in and how obvious it would be when we saw it. Sure enough, we found it. And what was obvious was the amount of artifacts that were lying beneath this rock. Remnants from stone tools was such an unexpected find. The variety of stone fragments found under this rock 
clearly show that this was a gathering place for ancient people, likely where they traded or made their tools. Most of these stone fragments are not found in this area and are found very, very far distances away, which makes one excited to think about how many different types of ancient people congregated in this area. We came to take a look at this at this rock, at this historical site, just to appreciate it and found huge amounts of debris on the ground from, from working with rock. So um, Tom's going to explain some of the findings that we have here um, in, in, with the correct archaeological terminology. This is fascinating. All right, guys, so we came up under here. We've got a very nice natural rock shelter. And what we found underneath is a quite, quite a diverse array of stone tools. But what is fascinating to us is that in this region, quartz is the only stone that is napable. It's really only this quartz material. However, what we've identified is a number of other materials as you can see here, what appears to be a nice great shirt, this really lovely kind of corally brown flint. It actually is very reminiscent of flint I've seen in places like the Middle East. Not to say that this is from the Middle East, but more to say this is very high grade material. And then, amazingly, obsidian as well. So this is absolutely evidence of either people traveling very, very long ways to quarry this stone, or more likely things like trade. And what's fascinating is, as we kind of predicted earlier, and as was shown here, it's very much a blade and core style industry. We've got this as a blade, as you can see, there's previous removals from a, from a larger core stone. And so a very, a very heavily, very heavily influenced by kind of the style of uh, stone they have here. What's really fascinating is this. This is a what, what we would call an old on chopper. Now, whether or not this is actually uh, of the same kind of antiquity as an old one tool, we don't know. But this is the sort of this is one of the earliest styles of stone tools they find in Olduvai Gorge, which is actually not too far from here. And this is unifacially flaked along one edge here to create a chopping tool. And this could be this could be 20 years old, and this could be over a million years old. It's very hard to to figure it out while it's sat here uh, straight on the ground. This could have sat here for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. So this is evidence of uh, interconnected peoples who are trading stone, but also a very interesting stone working technology. So this is a lunate, which is fascinating. We see these quite a lot among uh, microlithic assemblages. So as you can see, it's been flaked along that back margin and the way the flakes have traveled along here indicates that it's been flaked against an anvil. So it's been laying against something hard, probably another rock, and then struck along here to create that nice, abrupt, flat edge so that it could be mounted most likely onto an arrow shaft. Now, what's interesting is we generally don't see lunates retouched. However, considering how little stone is here, it's quite likely that they would have tried to reuse their tools as much as possible. But that is fascinating. That's, that's evidence of archery being used in this region definitely back before metal was uh, available. This was by far the most exciting find that Tom or myself has ever experienced in our lives. These small pieces of rocks are the representation of the Stone Age, of the Hudson's ancestors, of your ancestors, of my ancestors. Our hunter-gatherer past is such a stark reminder of how important it is to maintain the deep connection that we all had once with the natural world. It's an extremely challenging task to maintain that connection in today's modern world. But for some of us, we'll keep on striving just for that purpose.